Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 65 of the Ask Historians podcast. Uh, I want to start off by apologizing for our off week last week. Uh, I unfortunately uh, lost someone close to me uh, rather unexpectedly, so I was not in a particularly fit state to be uh, recording and editing. Uh, but we are back now. We're back on schedule. Uh, and it is, uh, by coincidence, by our, our delay, it is now the, the first uh, podcast episode of the month. So as promised, we are doing our Ask Historians podcast uh, book giveaway to our Patreon uh, supporters. So those are people who are, are donating at least $1. That's right. It's all it takes $1 at uh, patreon.com forward slash Ask Historians. And you too can get in on this. But uh, for right now, uh, let's go over the books that are up for grabs this time around. So we have a choice of four, as always. We have A Savage War of Peace, Algeria, 1954 to 1962 by Alistair Horn. Becoming Mexican-American, Ethnicity, Culture, and Identity in Chicano, uh, Los Angeles, 1900-1945 by George J. Sanchez. 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed by Eric H. Klein. That's about uh, the sea people. And Angkor and the Khmer Civilization by Michael D. Coe, who's probably more famous for being one of the most famous Mesoamericanists. Uh, but apparently in his retirement, he's decided to uh, brush up on his Southeast Asian history as well. So those are our four books, uh, which our lucky winner will get to pick one of them, and I will ship it to their door. So that lucky winner will be, and I'm really going to, I'm going to, at one point I'll actually just put a drum roll noise in here. But uh, until then, our winner today is Andrew Stead. So Andrew, I will be uh, contacting you via the email that you have on the Patreon account, and uh, we'll figure out uh, what, which one of these books that you'd like. And uh, we'll make the arrangements on, uh, on via that way. So uh, for this episode, though, we are going to be talking about Tibet. We're going to be talking about Buddhism. And as the title also implies, we're going to be talking about Bhutan. Although, as we find out later in the episode, much kind of deep into it, uh, it's not actually called Bhutan by the people who live in Bhutan. Uh, so the Bhutanese are not Bhutanese, at least not according to the Bhutanese. So uh, it's one of those areas of the world, uh, Tibet in particular, that gets a lot of woo, uh, usually to the detriment of it being understood as a real place. You know, it, it's always seen as this kind of like shining shangri la of, you know, holy men doing holy men stuff. But we can see that there's really tied into that is just some real practical politics and economic concerns and political rivalries and just personal disputes, uh, with personal disputes which can carry over generations through the through the amazing means of reincarnation. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Our, our guest is absolutely wonderful. And uh, we'll be back uh, to talk about some little more show notes at the end of the show here. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today I'm here with Jimmy Dorje, uh, who is a kind of a specializes in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Bhutan, uh, um, Bhutan, the country of Bhutan, Nepal, generally that kind of area in between what we think of as, as China and, Nepal and India. But before we get started on our conversation about that region of, of uh, the world today, uh, could you give us an idea about what got you interested in the subject? Sure. I don't have a particularly good story. I once watched a documentary on Ladakh, which is... Um, called Little Tibet. It's in the Jammu and Kashmir state of India. And um, unlike the majority of people in that area, they're neither Muslim or Hindu. They're Tibetan Buddhist. And something just clicked in my brain. And I've been interested in it ever since. So here I am. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking a lot about essentially kind of the formation of Bhutan. Um, and I think most people... Well, I mean, I think actually, think I, I guess I should preface that by saying most people have probably never heard of Bhutan. Um, so could you give us an idea about uh, what country we're talking about, what area we're talking about? Sure. If you look on the world map, you'll notice China, which covers uh, most of Tibet that we'll see. And then to the other side, you'll see India. And between those two countries are two smaller countries, a long skinny one that is Nepal. And most people are aware of Nepal today after the earthquake of last year. And um, just to the east, there's a tick of India and then Bhutan, which is actually directly north of Bangladesh. So that's the, the country that I, I don't want to use the word specialized, but that's the, the country that I'm most aware of and know more intimately. The formation of, of Bhutan, which I think, you know, what we're really going to be talking about today, 
the start of Bhutan really is rooted in uh, the Tibet region or, you know, what at what that time was, you know, the independent kingdom empire. I'm not sure the correct terminology, but, you know, the independent state of t- of Tibet. The, the peoples of the Himalayas come kind of from both ends. So one, say, say you can classify Nepal and Bhutan, their major difference being that the peoples of Nepal, or at least the ruling class of peoples from Nepal, migrated from the south. So the the kings of Nepal were originally from Rajasthan and India, and they brought with them religious traditions and cultures and languages from India. So Nepali is a relative of Hindi. It's an Indo-Aryan language, whereas most of the languages from Bhutan came from the north. So most people, and a very important person that we'll talk about soon, came from Tibet, and they speak a Tibetan, Tibeto-Burman language or variations of it. Yeah. So, so what time period are we talking about here then? Uh, at least for, at least in terms of, of, of Bhutan, not really kind of the, the whole overall migration. But for the purposes of this uh, particular episode of the podcast, what time period are we even talking about? Around the, uh, the 15 to 1600s is the, the date of the major formation of Bhutan. Um, but there are these cultural shifts that take place well, well before that time. Uh, and what sort of cultural shifts are those then that, that kind of inform what we're going to be talking about? The major cultural shifts concern different schools of Buddhism that take place in the in the area. The first diffusion of Buddhism takes place in the uh, 8th century with um, Padmasambhava, the lotus born, who was an Indian prince. Um, there was a brief century and a half period where Buddhism declined when the Tibetan Empire fell. And then we have a second diffusion around the 1000s and 1100s and the, the major, the dominant ethnic group in Bhutan is called the Ngalong, which means the first peoples. And first here refers to they were among the first people to convert to Buddhism. And so that kind of sets the stage for basically where we are. We have sort of these dramatic developments in Tibet and Bhutan and eventually the formation of Bhutan. Yeah, so it, it sounds like it, there was kind of, if I'm understanding correctly, that there was kind of a um, at this point that we're talking about in the kind of the 15th and 16th century, it sounds like there was another kind of shifting um, in the, and not just the, the, the theological, you know, sex of Buddhism difference, but also kind of in the political structures behind it as well. There were, we can actually, we can start, we can sort of start the story with the Mongols. When the Mongols invaded Tibet and took over, there were basically these warring principalities. Tibet was united and that in, into an empire and which fell in around 1841. And then it was just a collection of states and princes who were fighting for control. Um, the Mongols took over around 1250 something. And um, 1264, Hubla Khan offered uh, a, cer- a certain monk called Pagpa to rule over Tibet as a king, a vassal king. And Pagpo was the hierarch of the Sakya sect. So the Sakya, basically church, was given full authority over Tibet, and they were able to spread their influence over that area. Pagpo was a hereditary monarch, even though he was more or less a religious figure. And so his sons were the ones who ruled after him until eventually the Mongol Empire fell. So are we seeing at the time period that we're talking about, are we seeing basically... Uh, a continuation of this earlier uh, Sakyo kind of dominance? And also, are we seeing basically, because um, I know most people think of Tibet, they almost think of it as kind of this this theocratic nation where, you know, the monks rule over everyone. And that's not that's not incorrect. What um, most people fail to realize, because when we say monk, people mostly think uh, celibacy as a vow of celibacy, and they're not wrong. Um, the difference is that a lot of these monks take uh, lesser vows, which exclude celibacy first. And then later, when their position and more accurately, when the succession is secured, they take uh, greater vows, which include celibacy. So we're essentially having kind of monks that who also hold kind of temporal power. um, And until, of course, I guess they as they get older, they get less and less uh, invested in the temporal power, or at least they take more stricter vows. There's there's no there's no real straight dividing line but that's that is sort of how it runs when they take these greater vows the big one being celibacy um that doesn't necessarily mean they're less invested in the power structure in fact taking that greater vow at certain times has granted more legitimacy because it shows that they're more invested in the dharma in the sangha and that they're taking uh they're taking that 
life more seriously and are investing uh, more of their time and energy into it. So taking those extra vows uh, is, is, is also a form of strengthening your commitment to the position. And do we see kind of like, you know, because you'd said that this apparently was just, you know, one particular person of one particular sect that the, the Mongols had kind of picked out and said, you know, we're now your patron. I mean, but were there other kind of rival schools of power? And did, you know, uh, even at the time or even, you know, later in this kind of later period that we're talking about? There were. The the schools are essentially split into two sections. The first based on when they when they came to Tibet. So the uh, original school was the Nyingma which was founded by Padmasambhava mentioned earlier, um, which basically means the elder, the elder school. And each of the sects of Buddhism contains a little bit of the Nyingma because they were there first. The later schools, the most important ones that we'll be talking about are the Sakya, who are here in power now with Pagpa, the Kajyu, which are going to become the important one for Bhutan. And then sort of uh, contemporary with the Kajyu are the Kadampa, who would later evolve into the Gelugpa, And people would be more or less familiar with the Gelugpa because um, that's the sect that the Dalai Lama is the head of. What are the kind of, I guess it's probably a conversation in and of itself, but what are the major doctrinal differences here? Or or is this more of kind of like a regional thing? You know, people over in the east are Gelugpa, people over in the west are Kaguya. Uh, or is or are there kind of very substantial differences between these groups? There are There are more intimate philosophical differences, which is well beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. but the the more simple differences that I can point out right now are that the the Kajupa, and this is by no mean this is by no means exclusive or or means that they they don't concentrate on other things, but the Kajupa are known for um, oral transmission. In fact, if you read Heinrich Har's Seven Years in Tibet, he has these odd names for the schools the the schools of Tibetan Buddhism that he calls the the orthodox school the reform school and the oral school and so the orthodox school is the the nyingma because they're the older and then the reform school is the gelugpa and the oral is the kajupa so the kajupa are known for being an oral sect and passing passing along um their information that way and they're less known for for book learning um, whereas the Gelugpa did have more of uh, of a, a learning and philosophy focus, while the Kajupa were known for more meditate meditation. But again, that doesn't mean that say the Gelugpa don't meditate or that the Kajupa don't study and and practice philosophy. It's just a matter of concentration. And it's important to recognize also that more that people who are lay Buddhists don't really think about those differences as much. My favorite story is that in when the, the Chinese came to Tibet and passed out a census to find out who was part of which sect, their reaction of most Tibetans was either confusion or just insult that they were even being asked this question. So, so this is more of something like something that management would worry about, not necessarily everybody below that. Yeah, it's um, it's sort of like the the common folk don't care what what. Game of Thrones, the High Lords play, you know, <laughs> very topical. Um, so, but I mean, these also represent because you know we are talking about uh, you know elites and their game of monasteries, um, but these also represent power blocks, right? You know, because the, these monasteries are also not just centers of of learning and centers of of uh, theology, but they're also centers of like real economic and political power. They are. So, if we go back to the Mongols, who are patronizing uh, Pagpa and the Sakya school in Tibet. When the Mongols leave, that does create sort of a power vacuum in Tibet. And what happens is the, the Sakya try and retain that power for a time, but you have another sect basically overthrow the, the Sakya and then start patronizing their sect. So in this case, it was well, it's similar to Korea. You ha often have an officer. So an officer of the Sakya sect was um, one of the Pagma Drupa, was from the Pagma Drupa sect, who I believe was one of the Keju. And he ended up overthrowing the Sakya and then patronizing the Pagma Drupa Keju sect. And this goes on well into the 1500s that you have various Keju subsects fighting for control of Tibet at the time until we have uh, the Tsangpa rulers who 
have control of at least half of Tibet and are on their way to full control when the Zhabdrung is born in 1594. So these Mm -hmm. Kaju sects are fighting, fighting, fighting over control of Tibet. And their transmission, as we mentioned earlier, is mostly hereditary, but not always father to son. One, this is where this is where the details of monastic life get a little tricky, is that if you are a younger monk and you just want to go straight for the monastic life, not have to worry about a wife, not have to worry about descendants, you just have your brother's son inherit. So a lot of the transmission we see in these histories is from uncle to nephew. In this, you know, because we're talking a lot about inheritance, but I think most people associate particularly Tibetan Buddhism um, with this kind of reincarnation of people, you know, in the sense that it's not transmitted from father to son, but kind of father to reborn father. Yeah, that is that's that dates back to um, 1284. There we go. This this idea is called uh, Tulku, which goes back goes back to India this idea of someone who is reincarnated and is recognized as a as another person so this goes back this goes back well into um medieval india but in terms of tibet when that becomes a more important thing is around the year 1284 when we have a line of lamas called the karmapas they still exist you can actually look them up um but you have a line of a certain teacher called the karmapas and there was uh, Ran Jung Dorje, who was identified as an incarnation, as a reincarnation of a very famous lama named Karma Pakshi. Karma Pakshi was declared the second Karmapa Lama, and Ran Jung Dorje then was the third Karmapa Lama as a direct reincarnate of him. And one, the main difference between this and just anyone else who was being re, who is who has been reincarnated, like you or I, in Tibetan theology would be that Ranjung Dorji then inherited all of the properties and privileges of Karma Pakshi, including Karma Pakshi's position in the Mongol court. Now, how prevalent was this at the time, then, if we're looking at, say, the, the 15th, 16th century at this time? I mean, was that the primary mode of transmission, or was it simply just kind of one among all? You know, was it some some monasteries were doing this kind of reincarnation uh, transmission, and some were doing more kind of sticking with the older hereditary transmission? I hesitate to I hesitate to place a value on it because I'm not I'm not entirely sure how common it was and with these sorts of things I'm not sure I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to say that it was that common but it was certainly on people's minds it, it was certainly on people's minds in the 1500s and had come to replace some of the hereditary transmission but it's more it's more accurate to say that they existed in tandem and then started to exist in conflict. So let's set the stage for what we're, you know, kind of focused down that we have a little bit of background here. But let's set the stage and kind of regroup and say, you know, what is the major conflict that we're going to be talking about? Because it seems like the what ends up founding Bhutan is kind of a, a conflict within these um, within these you know various sects. So what is the what is the state of Tibet, you know, kind of politically, uh, religiously at this time? So we can start we can start up. I'm going to do a little bit of a, a scan survey of the area. If we start up north, up by Mongolia, let's say that's about 1527, that up by Mongolia, there's warring tribes, that the different, the different cons, it's a little bit more complex politically, but there's, there's basically these warring tribes who are all, all want more power, who all have this dream of reuniting the empire of Chinggis Khan. We move south, we can look east, and there's Ming, there's Ming China more or less on its last legs soon enough. Farther south, you have Tibet, and Tibet, again, is is mostly warring against itself, with the most dominant player being the Tsangpa rulers. And Tsang, uh, T-S-A-N-G, is the area of south-central Tibet. It's concentrated around Lhasa and down the road to the west, Shigatse. So that's, that's the Tsang kingdom, and the rulers now are the Tsangpa, who are patronizing, I believe, the uh, not the Kadapa, the Karmapas of the Karmapa Lama that we just discussed earlier. So th- that's the most dominant player in the area. But again, the Kaju order, which is the most common school of Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet in the 1500s, has many subsects who are still kind of fighting against each other, competing for influence. There's no real political unity, the exception of the Tsangpas, but that's not even that uh, unified at the time. And if we continue going south, 
we have what would soon become Bhutan, which is kind of split in half. It, on the western half, we have, I don't want to say there's any real union or political anything. It's uh, a loose confederation of areas and peoples to the east, even less so. And part of that's geography. The mountains in the eastern half of Bhutan are much higher, much more dramatic than those in the western half. And then farther south, you have India. In between Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, and Bhutan, you have a monastery called Ralong. And Ralong was founded in 1180 by a man named Tsang Pagyare. Tsang Pagyare was a Kajupa monk who founded an entirely new sect of Kaju called the Drukpa. And that just means the dragon people. Okay. So, I mean, that's a marvelous rundown. So what is the significance of this, of this you know, dragon people sect then? So the significance comes in where Tsang Pagyare, as we were discussing, um, started a hereditary lineage of, of, of lamas. So his son and his son, and then sometimes it switches up and goes to his nephew, to his son, to his brother, right? The, the succession is, is never really assured and never really dominant. And in a few instances, they recognize such and such as a reincarnation of his grandfather or his great granduncle or whatever. But the succession in Ralung, in this dragon monastery, is all within a single family, the Gya family. Um, so in 1270, in 1476, Kunga Paljor dies, and he was a direct descendant of Tsang Pagyari who founded the monastery. He has a nephew who inherits the monastery, but an important consideration is that another family was declared um, their child his reincarnation. So we, we have kind of a problem with this kind of dual method of inheritance where, you know, you can inherit through your family or you can inherit through someone saying, no, this person is the reincarnation. And the, an important thing to consider here is that there didn't seem to be much of a conflict at this point in 1478. It doesn't seem like any real conflict develops that threatens the, the nature of the monastery, that it seems like this this uh, hereditary inheritance and the spiritual reincarnation could exist side by side. So there were another four lamas who were inheriting and controlling the, the monastery. Uh, meanwhile, the reincarnated lineage just kept continuing. Um, but you can't imagine how this degrades a little bit of the influence that, oh, well, you know, your, your spirit is off teaching and giving these lessons what does it matter if you have this this body, this blood, this bone teaching here at the monastery? And and um, how, and how significant was this uh, this uh, uh, what was the monastery name again? Ralong. 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 Yeah. yeah. How significant was this monastery? I mean, was this a particularly large and, and important one? Uh, it was the there was a, <laughs> I'm not sure how common the saying was. I hear it a lot, but mostly through other Drukpa sources. But the saying is um, the saying is half the world. Half the world are Drukpas, half the Drukpas are uh, sacred teachers, and half the sacred teachers are wandering beggars. Something like, I'm not getting that exactly right, but the sentiment is there about how common the Drukpas were, especially in Tsang, which by comparison to the area around it was relatively peaceful. So Ralung was a very important spiritual center at the time, and it was a very prestigious position. So do we, do we have this kind of, you know, not only prestigious, but also this kind of important and also, um, I mean, I guess this kind of, you know, very central monastery, not only the Drukpas, but the Drukpas are very important to this kind of centralized area of Tibet, but also you have this bifurcation of the lineage. And I assume, I guess, through foreshadowing and having read ahead, this comes to a bit of a conflict. It does. So... Our real conflict starts, I would say, in about 1527. You have a very, you have a man born, Pema Karpo, um, born outside the Gya family, not to Raolang. And Pema Karpo, um, to put his very illustrious life in short terms, was a great philosopher, a great teacher. Uh, he built several monasteries, that he was just a very famous individual, and that his, his life was very, uh, very prestigious. And so the Gya family figures, hey, having, the reincarnated lineage and our bone lineage, these cultures focus more on the on the bone than the blood, back in our in one family would be great for us and it would be very advantageous for us to have that. So what happens in 1594 when Ngawang Namgyal is born is they declare him 
the reincarnation of Pema Karpo. Um, and it's a bit unclear about when this prophecy was given. It might have been retroactive, but there was apparently at some point a prophecy that Pema Karpo would be born in two bodies, um, which is not uncommon. And so not only is Nawang Namgyal declared the reincarnate of Pema Karpo, but also a young boy named Pagsam Wangpo is born, is a uh, named the reincarnate of Pema Karpo. So it, it seems like their attempt to unify the lineages uh, just basically unified them and then immediately created a new bifurcation. Yes, it immediately failed. In 1596, the the Ralang hierarchs, um, so Nawang Namgyal's father and grandfather, are brought to investigate Pagsam Wangpo, who is only three years old at the time. They come to the conclusion that he is not the reincarnate after they show him a relic that the three-year-old fails to recognize, and he looks at the father and grandfather and is very afraid. And they leave and say, oh no, he's obviously not the reincarnate of Pema Karpo, that's my own son, Nawang Namgyal. He is the reincarnate, he is he is the true, the true heir. Okay, so it seems like that kind of seals the problem then. You would think, but then it becomes an issue of... Uh, who knows who, who is whose friend, and of course, that means who should get Ralung, because as we have seen earlier, the Tulku inherits all these properties. So so even though this has kind of been this this test of of, uh, of Pogsam, it, it seems like, okay, well, the test failed, but did it really? Exactly. So if um, Pogsam Wangpo was born to a family of yak herders, this probably wouldn't have been a problem. He was actually born to a family of nobles who did have properties, and he did end up inheriting one of Pogsam Wangpo's uh, monasteries that he built. Uh, not Pogsam, one of Pema Karpo's monasteries that he built. So Pogsam Wangpo and Nong Namgyal are kind of evenly matched at this point, and now it becomes a battle of friends. Pogsam Wangpo ends up making friends with the governor of his province, who then appeals to the Tsangpa king. So wait, and, before before we get too far ahead, uh, so Pogsam did not end up inheriting directly the uh, Rilong, uh, Rilong Mon- Monastery, the one that we've been talking about. Exactly. Uh, the, the other guy did. Yes, Nawang, Nawang Namgyal did. Um, for, for, for ease of people who wanted to look this up and for the rest of the conversation, um, Nawang Namgyal later earns, he earns a title at age eight. I'm not sure why at age eight. But he earns a title named, called, which is the Jabdrung. And Jabdrung means literally at whose feet one submits. Okay, so we have the Zabdrung, who is the kind of recognized reincarnation of this very famous older monk who inherits, who he's the Tolku, who inherits uh, the Rong uh, Monastery. Uh, and then we have uh, Pogsam, who is uh, kind of the not kind of officially recognized I- I- reincarnation of this older monk, but he has. A very important family, so he ends up inheriting a, a different monastery. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then Pogsam uh, ends up with some friends in kind of the royal court of the Songpas. Yes. Okay. Just making sure that we're kind of keeping it all together. So what happens after, I mean, I, I take it then the appeal to the Songpa king is to say, look, really, uh, the Rolong monastery should be mine. Yeah, pretty much. So now it, now it becomes an issue of of can can the ruler decide on one end or will he try and appeal to this this prophecy this idea that hey we can still we can have two reincarnates of the same person which again is not unprecedented and exists all over the place today the the big event happens in 1614 so the Jabdrung who's uh 20 at this point he's kind of known for being a little bit of a hothead the Jabdrung is invited to the Tsangpa Palace in Shigatse. And so Shigatse is? Shigatse is to the west of Lhasa. Um, it is down the road. And um, this is the kind of like the, the royal city? Uh, I'd hesitate to call it a city, certainly at that, <laughs> certainly at that <laughs> point. Um, but it is, it is a large population center. Um, it's, it's the center of power for the Tsangpa rulers. And the Tsangpa comes out to the gate to meet the Jabdrung. And the Jabdrung rides ahead on his horse through the gate and all the way to the steps of the central tower, which certainly sets the Tsangpa ruler a bit off his rocker. And he's a bit, wow, this is someone to deal with. So the, the Zabdrung just kind of comes in and says, uh, well, and just kind of shows that he is not perhaps uh, particularly interested in kind of coming to an amicable agreement. He's, he's certainly not interested in being bullied out of his position, that's for sure. 
I, I like to think that he was amicable, which which most of the historians seem to agree that he he was someone to contend with, but he was not an un, unreasonable person. Was is what most of the histories I've read about him. Over overshadowing this right now in 1614 is that the the Tsangpa rulers patronized the Kadampa sect of the Keju order, whereas the the fight, of course, is over the Drukpa sect. So the Tsangpa ruler is a bit of a questionable person, although maybe he's the best person because he doesn't have a huge dog in this fight, right? It's not the order that he has to pay money to. He's just trying to keep a little bit of peace in an area where that he doesn't have to think about. Around this time, the Mongols are actually starting to make inroads to the north and the west. So you can understand that the Tsangpa ruler might want to keep his southern flank secure and not devote any troops that way. What was what was the intention of this meeting then? I mean, what was the kind of the the ultimate desired outcome? Um it's it's difficult to say well it's difficult to say either way. I imagine there was probably degrees of of intention, the top one being, okay, figure out who are we dealing with, what exactly does he want, uh where maybe is he willing to to agree or disagree like maybe for example, he'll He'll say yes to multiple incarnations of Hemakarpo, but he will not move on the issue of Rolung, that Rolung has to stay with him and with the family. I imagine that there's, there's a big element of just that, of just fi- fact finding in this sort of mission and trying to instill a little bit of goodwill to make sure he's not making an enemy for life. Either way, the, the, the meeting is kind of pointless that it's polite, except for that that one incident of riding the horse, it's, it's polite, it's cordial, all the necessary rituals take place. Um, but otherwise nothing, nothing much really happens. And over, overhanging the Jabdrung's head at this point is, uh, a Drukpa monastery was just converted forcefully into a Kandampa one. Oh, okay. So, so let me, let me just kind of catch you off right there because how does one forcefully convert a Buddhist monastery? You, you, basically take the teachers and you say you now need to teach this doctrine the the difference is like i said before the differences between these uh schools are mostly kind of intimate doctrinal differences and and they are i'm sure you've heard the expression the fighting is fierce when the rewards are few <laughs> yes that's that's kind of how i think about a lot of these fighting about a lot of these um these these wars are over are over the real details of of buddhist theology the 13th dalai lama had to fire a transcriber of the tibetan canon because he was purposefully altering the text to to basically call the kajupas and the and the um and the Nyingmapas liars and show that the galukpa were right all along so he was taking the controversial passages and changing them um, this was in the, I think, I want to say 19, 1905, but, but you get that idea that there's these, these controversial passages that, that they're deliberately changing and fighting over. Um, so, so you forcefully convert this monastery by basically taking the teacher, forcing them to teach that. If they refuse, you just take them out, you put your own in, um, you take out scriptures, say that they don't recognize, um, yeah, you just you just take it and change everything. So, I mean, this is this is to put this in terms that I think more uh, kind of you know most of our listeners are kind of in in Europe and the United States. I think to to put it in terms that they would kind of uh, be more familiar with, this is less kind of like the Franciscan a monastery being suddenly becoming like a Dominican monastery, you know. And honestly, most people would not notice because they're just like, well, they're a bunch of guys in robes. Um, it's maybe a little more forceful than that. But it's certainly less than like a Catholic church converting to like a Baptist church. I'm I'm, okay. I, I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to draw <laughs> such a. Teach anything. Yeah, I'm hesitant to draw a lot of these distinctions um, or a lot of these comparisons. I would say it could be like, say, taking. Yeah, as if as if this wasn't gonna gonna <laughs> try people the wall. Spire take a lot of control. Take like um, take a mosque, right? <laughs> Take a, take a mosque and if you, you know, and, and you, you forcefully change it from a, a Sunni to a Shia one, the text they're working with is still the same, right? The, 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 the Quran doesn't change, right? It's, it's always in Arabic. It's always says the same thing, but the interpretation changes and, um, the history behind it has changed and the, the commentaries that people are writing are going to change as well. 
So, I mean, I, I think that kind of puts it more in context would be like, look, everybody's drawing from the same source material, but they're interpreting it differently. So, you know, you when you come in and you forcefully, forcefully convert a monastery, you're simply saying, look, stop interpreting this way, start interpreting this way. Exactly. And and so one of the interesting things um, of, of the 20th century uh, post PRC Tibet is that um, the Dalai Lama, who's who's a hierarch of the Kajup of the uh, not Kajupa, the Gelukpa order, is heavily involved in both preserving and recognizing incarnates from other sects. But since there isn't really political power to fight over or armies to to deal with, it seems like this is an almost entirely an amicable relationship, and that they're just kind of feeding off each other, trying to preserve the diversity of. Tibetan Buddhist thought, whereas uh, in the 1600s, in 1614, certainly, that's like unthinkable <laughs> that that uh, people are going to be helping out and preserving each other's school, although it's not entirely unique, as we'll see in a few seconds. But um, but that's that's kind of what we're dealing with is these schools that are fighting mostly over doctrinal differences. And it soon becomes who's your best friend? Oh, this big guy with a sword. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the discussion over how to interpret something becomes much more important when you're also fighting over, you know, land and taxes and kind of, uh, you know, right. who gets control, actual uh, power. Right, right. So, I mean, but you said that this uh, convert, forcible conversion of this monastery was kind of important in the background, particularly for uh, the Zabdrung. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit it's a bit alarming that the... Um, I mean, consider consider the Jabdrung's point of view, right? He has this monastery that's been in his family since 1180, and he's supposed to be meeting with a man who, at least at first glance, is more uh, amenable to your rival who claims that he should own the monastery. This man doesn't even support your sect of, of the teachings at all, and he has a history of converting monasteries from your sect that you are the hierarch of to his sect so what's to say that he doesn't just either end this debate by taking ralong himself or end it by just going in with an army and seating pag sam wangpo in your place and then having pag sam wangpo be the new trukpa hierarch so i think you know the jabdrung's uh sometimes he seems to me like oh he's being a little he's definitely the jerk in this scenario but when you consider it from his perspective of of, of he needs to show a stronger face otherwise he could just he could very easily be walked over i think it makes a lot more sense from that perspective so i mean it seems like this initial meeting was pretty much doomed to fail yeah it's it's whatever whatever its initial purpose was quickly goes out the window regardless on their way on his way back to ralung from from shigatse he's crossing a river and there at the river crossing there's a ferry boat and there's a Karmapa Lama with some attendants trying to cross the reverse way. And the, so, the Karmapa are the ones who, had, this is the, the school that had actually, the, the other monastery had been forcibly converted to, right? Exactly. So so already, the you can just imagine his adrenaline is going from this meeting. Here's a Karmapa Lama, right, coming the other way. And so he gets on the boat and the Karmapa Lama's attendants drag him out of the boat. And so he's in the water and now the Jabdrung's attendants feeling very offended. And, you know, who are these guys? They end up killing these two attendants. And as they're on the boat and more of the Karmapa attendants are, are drowning in the water, the Jabdrung is in the boat and he orders them to rescue the other attendants. Everybody's in the boat. They get to the other side and he kind of dusts everyone off and he says, OK, you go on your way. I'm going back to Ralong, but this is over. The the main history I'm I'm the book I went and got the history of Bhutan by Karma Funso he basically says that was it there was no reconciling at that point that ended everything um, because what happens after that is the Tsangpa orders the Jabdrung to pay the fine for homicide and the Jabdrung says why I didn't do anything wrong they attacked me first okay. and that you so uh, so essentially the 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 so essentially the temporal ruler is saying. Hey, you need to pay this fine, but uh, the Zabdrung is saying, you know, this is purely in self-defense, and also, you know, it, it seems like the that the the Song Paul ruler might actually have some skin in this game because he is kind of supporting this rival sect of these people who were who were murdered. Exactly. So I, I take it the Zabdrung did not pay. Uh, he did not. Um, he was simply insulted that he was even asked to pay, 
And the Tsangpa ruler then demanded, when the Zhabdrung had refused, he then demanded that the Zhabdrung turn over all relics. Uh, the, rel- the, the most important one in question, which was not done being fought over at all, was a, a vertebra bone from Tsangpa Gyara, who founded the monastery that had turned into a rel- uh, an image of the Buddha. And that was the, the, the main relic. It's, this is the one that people are coming from miles, miles away, um, in pilgrimage to Rolling for. Um, so he's demanding they turn over this relic. He's demanding that he turn over authority of the monastery to him so he can decide what to do with it. The situation has spiraled out of control. And, um, in around 1616, there's these rumors that the Tsangpa ruler is sending a secret army to attack Rolling and capture him. So, I mean, does, does Rolling Monastery have something like that could defend against an army? You know, I, I mean, how, how big and how powerful were these monasteries at the time? Uh, difficult, difficult to say one way or the other. I know I don't have, a lot of these things aren't very, uh, they're not recorded as, as, as well. And even then you have to question some of the recordings. The images of Rolling today are certainly not very impressive, but centuries of neglect and the Cultural Revolution you know, who who really knows what it looked like at 1616, but it's certainly worth considering that um, it was, it was a very, it was maybe not a large population center, but considering that Lhasa was not at what we would consider its current glory, that um, there were no real trading centers considering the state of technology at the time, I would, I would say that Rolong had, had certainly the potential to be a rather large place that could withstand some sort of attack and siege. But when you think of the Tsangpa ruler and that he was only a few years from controlling basically all of Tibet in about 1620, 1621, that the Tsangpa ruler certainly had more uh, more to gain. And while the Zhabdrung had basically just everything to lose at the time. So I'm not I'm not entirely sure how how big and powerful Rolling was, but um, certainly the, the Tsangpa ruler was much more powerful. Yeah. So what was the Zabrung's response to this? I, you know, this, this rumor of an army marching towards Ralong. As is usually the case in these things, they start performing, uh, rituals and divinations and the rituals and divinations are preceded by advisors trying to tell him what to do. So he had two advisors in this case, one saying to go to Mongolia and appeal to the Mongols and return with an army. The other one was a Bhutanese or the place that would become Bhutan, uh, advisor who suggested that the Zhabdrung flee southwards instead, um, where most of the people in the area at the time was called Lomon. He said that where the most of the people in Lomon are actually Drukpa, and um, there were there were cousins who were ruling monasteries there who could um, who could take him in and shelter him from Tibetan forces. So he performed divinations, and they he did they did all these dances and. And, and, these lo, tests, and lo and behold, it showed that he should go to the more sensible southern path. Yes, there was there were all these things. Um, the the divinations I apparently confirmed it, but the most of the stories point to instead it was his dreams that um, that pointed southwards. He had a dream of a raven, and the raven is the symbol of Mahakala, who was the Zhabdrung's own patron deity. And the raven flew southward, so he woke up. They did a divination. The divination confirmed it. He grabbed his staff, his sheep, uh, 30 attendants, and they marched southwards. So I mean, was it just this him and these 30 attendants then? Or was it kind of this mass exodus? Or, you know, did they, did they take this, uh, this holy relic, this vertebrae of the founder? They did, take, they did take the holy relic. This initial flight was 30 attend, him and 30 attendants. Um, I, the, the date is a little bit unclear, but in one of the sources, they do talk about a snowstorm that they were trapped under. And it's difficult, again, to know if this was dramatization or an actual event. So it could have taken place in the winter, making a mass exodus probably less likely. Either way, it was just 30 at the time. What I would like to soon be, be looking into is the, the greater phenomena of Keju flight from Tibet. So this is taking place in a larger context of Kaju fleeing, I hesitate to use the word fleeing, but migrating southwards from Tibet into um, the southern flank of the Himalayas. So you had Kaju going into Ladakh, far to the west. You had Kaju going into Mustang, which is today in Nepal. Um, and then, of course, now you have them going into Bhutan. So this is taking place in a greater context of Drukpa migration, but at this time it's just 30 in 1616. 
and and were they pursued or you know were they not pursued uh were they welcomed with with open arms as they got to these uh Loman people they were they were welcomed with open arms there were many monasteries and temples um Bhutan at the time was a cocktail shall we say of different much smaller uh tibetan buddhist schools so the jabdrung will, will certainly ruffle some feathers as he appears and tries to consolidate control um because there are these smaller schools with traditions and teachings that are not exactly in line with his so he was he was definitely welcomed with open arms to those who already accepted him and including these famous cousins of his and he would soon be pursued um, but certainly not immediately. So the first war, I don't have an exact date for it. And as much as I look, I can't find one would take place between 1616 and 1620 within that time frame. But it appears that it wasn't immediate. My guess is the Tsangpa ruler thought out of sight, out of mind. But the Zhabdrung's father is still in Ralung and still controlling it and keeping it. But it doesn't seem that it was attacked. As yeah, far because as cause the, the immediate reason for attacking it, the Zhabdrung himself had fled. Exactly. So when he fled to, you know, what is now Bhutan, but when he fled to this area, I mean, was the Zabdrung thinking about, you know, regrouping his forces and coming back? Or was this kind of like, well, let's pack up and move over here for now? That's an excellent question. And it seems like that was his original intention was more or less to to flee and then return. But what soon happens in Tibet is, as I said, the Mongols in um, are there to the north of Tibet and to the west. One of the most powerful of these Mongol tribes is the Koshat, whose uh, leader was Gushri Khan. And Gushri Khan, I don't, I don't think he was born at the time of the Jabdrung fleeing. I'd have to double check the dates. But um, his patron Lama was the man was the, or the boy who would soon be declared the fifth Dalai Lama, and who was of course a Galukpa. So the Galukpas and the Kosha and the fifth Dalai Lama and Gushri Khan all swoop into Tibet and knock aside the Tsangpa kings, knock aside all the rival lamas, and come into Lhasa and basically proclaim a new government, um, which, except for a few hiccups, would stay in power until 1959. So by the time they take over and the this most powerful Mongol tribe on the entire steppe uh, basically takes dominion of Ralung, and that's in 1642, so some time between then, but um, the Zhabdrung is still busy consolidating, building... Um, and until then, he still hoped to return to Ralung, but by 1642, when the Mongols and the Galukpa take over, that's basically a, a dead dream. So it seems like in a way that the, the Zabdrung kind of got out at the right time, because, you know, had he still been in, you know, Tibet, then he would have been kind of swept up in this this reorganization, both of, of uh, the Buddhist sect in charge and also the, the actual temporal power. Uh, yes, the the... The Bhutanese today say that they are they are thankful of the incident with the boat and the ferry and the river because without it he would have never left Tibet. <laughs> so I mean, how does the the Zabrung end up you know kind of setting himself up in Bhutan? Then I mean, is is he kind of trying? I mean, is is there an idea of like kind of setting up his own kind of temporary government? It sounds like you you've mentioned kind of he was consolidating power among these smaller sects and smaller uh, monasteries at the time. But I mean, is he setting up a system like we had seen in Tibet with kind of like a, a a centralized power which is also kind of uh, centralized in a singular sect as well he he builds a series of zongs and you'll usually see zongs um d z o n g uh called fortress monasteries i prefer just to call them castles much simpler um but he's building these these zongs which you can still see in bhutan today and they are first of all magnificent to behold um, but they're still they're still in use as both as both uh, spiritual centers, as uh, civil centers, and as defensive structures in certain instances. So so their primary their primary use is as as a, it's a castle. It's a defensive structure against invasion, both from probably I don't I don't want to say tribesmen, but both from locals and from the northerners who would invade a total I believe of seven or eight times. And the, the, these zongs would be the main areas of contention. But they would also have the central tower, the Yutse, which is not which is not unique to Bhutan. It's also in Tibet, which is yellow roofed and is the normal house for the monastic establishment. And then sort of an outer wall that is the primary defensive structure and is where a lot of the civil administration takes place. 
So their their original intent and purpose has mostly not changed. They've you know if you go there today, you'll see they've kind of stapled some wires and screwed in some light bulbs, but it, it's been, <laughs> it's basically unchanged, um, with the exception of a few fires and some that had to be rebuilt. But those all there are a, a very few that predate the Jabdrung, but in uh, 16. 1629, the Jabdrung lays the foundation for his first song, a quite quite a s- small one by comparison with the others, but it's called Simtoka Zong um, on the northern side of Timpu Valley. And um, it's just the first of many that he builds. But he builds Simtoka Zong in 13, 1637, he builds Punaka Zong, which has its, we could do a whole pod- podcast just on Punaka Zong. <laughs> but he builds Punaka Zong. And the important thing here is that he builds Punaka on the model of Ralong. So when he builds Punaka, he's he's very intently thinking this is the new Ralong. So by 1637, he's probably thinking that if he does ever gain regain control of Ralong, that it will be from Punaka. That he's probably not thinking again that he's moving to Ralong and will rule Punaka from it. It's very much the opposite. That 1637 to me is the dividing line between when the Jabdrun thinks that he's here and he's he's here to stay. Now, to go back to something you'd mentioned kind of very at the beginning, did the Zabdrung take these lesser vows that allowed him to um, to take a wife, to have children, or was, you know, or when, or was he celibate? Uh, nope, he was, he was still at this time, still under his lesser vows. As I was looking through the notes, he takes the vows of a lay Buddhist, and there's only there's only five of them, so it's, they're they're pretty easy vows. And it, when it concerns sexual activity, the lay Buddhist takes only a vow to refrain from uh, sexual immorality. So that's pretty broad category, if you ask me. Um, and he took those vows when he was eight, which seems a little young. Um, and in 1631, his son John Paul Dorji is born. John Paul Dorji so, is declared so- a reincarnation of his grandfather. So, I mean, so is there is there idea to have essentially the, the Zabdrung's lineage? continue on because it sounds like at this point he's pretty make he's making it pretty clear that in this kind of southern area that you know we now call Bhutan that he is the the power to be reckoned with yes so so 1631 his son is born and he intends to he intends to have both this reincarnated and this bone lineage in tandem going going as one for forever it doesn't turn out like that but two years after his son is born, the Jabdrung takes full vows as a Buddhist monk. So his son is two years old. He and uh, the rest of the monks who are advising him in this say, hey, everything's assured. Now, since we're trying to consolidate control over this land, take your full vows. That will really impress people. That will give you extra prestige. And so he does in 1633. And and everyone lived happily after after. <laughs> Yes, yes, but life is not a song, little dove. 1633 takes his vows, uh, he takes uh, full vows as a Buddhist monk. 1634, the Battle of Five Lamas takes place. That is not a joke, that's literally what they call it. The new Tsangpa king invades Bhutan, defeats local resistance, uh, captures Simtoka Tsang, and um, that would have been it. They would have succeeded, except that the ammunition in the Tsang caught fire and exploded, and the Tibetans entirely retreated. In eight years, the fifth Dalai Lama and the Mongols come to power in Tibet, and the Jabdrung thinks, "Hey, this is a new day," and thinks that this will be uh, this will be an opportunity for me to recover Ralung. This will be an opportunity to make peace with the the Galukpas, with the other Kajupas. What the Jabdrung fails to consider is that Paksam Wangpa was actually a cousin of the fifth Dalai Lama. And so it does not end up like that. He sends a messenger off to Lhasa to try and make peace. And in 1648, uh, two Tibetan armies <laughs> invade Bhutan. So it, it seems like these kind of like, you know, fortress, monastery, castles are coming uh, pretty in handy. Yeah, the so the Bhutanese um, repel, let's just call it that there were seven wars. The Bhutanese repel six out of seven invasions. And then the, the seventh blows up. Well, the seventh one was actually the seventh one that I'm saying that they didn't repel was the last one when um, the Tibetans won and they forced kind of an unfair treaty on the Bhutanese. But really, all they got out of it was some extra money and and a little bit of a prestige bump. But they give up trying to hold Bhutan and retreat back to Tibet. And so they count that they count that the Simtoka Zong blowing up. They count that as a victory, which I'll give to them. But yeah, that's that's 
yeah, these songs certainly come in handy and they do they do function as they were intended. Well, I mean, how was the Zabdrung actually ruling this area then? Because, you know, it sounds like r- really, again, you know, he's the he's the guy in charge. But I mean, is he setting it up essentially as he had it in, in Ralong or is he because it sounds like he's taking less of the role of, you know, head of a monastery and more of the role of a king. Although, you know, clearly, as you've been talking in this part of the world at this time, those two aren't necessarily separate. No, exactly. In um I'm I'm a little bit unclear as how exactly, as we've talked earlier, how exactly Rallung was set up and how it was ruling. In Bhutan, what he sets up is called a dual system government. And uh, again, I'm a little bit unclear of the details about how far back this sort of history extends. But as it concerns Bhutan, when the Jabdrung sets up a dual system, uh, you can imagine a little bit of a Christmas tree. And it's sort of like a feudal structure, but we have a clear dividing line between a religious half and a temporal half. And if you look on, on the Bhutanese flag, you can sort of understand this representation. The half of the flag is uh, orange for the, the monks, um, what, they call, what they call in Zonka the Jatsang, and the yellow is um, the saffron royal color, so for the king. But of course, there's no king at this time, it's just the Jabdrung. So the Jabdrung is at the top of this um, hierarchy, and the Jabdrung is supposed to be the union of the spiritual and the temporal heads. So he has this in mind that that's going to be a, a hereditary lineage directly to his son. Below the Jabdrung are the two branches, and the top of the temporal branch of the secular world is the Desi, who I guess acts like a viceroy and operates all of the secular governors and princes and is in charge of sort of the, the peace of the province. And on the other side, on the religious side, is the J Kenpo, which literally means the holy abbot. And he rules the monks and the the monasteries and temples. So they're they're basically functioning on two separate laws. They're very symbiotic. Part of what I imagine the Jabdrung offers is is just defense. That a lot of the Bhutanese economy, well into the the nineteenth century, is on raiding <laughs> and just kind of capturing what you can and bringing back to to vitalize your own economy. Um, so part of what I imagine the Jabdrung is offering is just defense that um, in Bhutan today, a lot of the Zongs still serve as marketplaces and um, the, the village of people is, is right there below them. So I imagine uh, you can just run right to the, the Zong. You can just pull up. The, there's usually a big ladder that goes into them or, or just huge gates and you just close them up and you just wait. So a lot of a lot of what he's offering is um, is structured administration, rule of law. Um, Very basic stuff, which I don't want to say was uncommon in Bhutan, but he certainly made it uh, more prevalent and more applicable. Well, it it sounds like it was it was present, but uh, in in a fractured sense. Yes. um, Yeah. When when Bhutanese history continues through the 17 and the 1800s, it usually says, oh, hundreds of years of civil war. But that to me is always a little bit of a misnomer that it's it it doesn't accurately represent the, the real localization of these conflicts. So, so when it's, when I'm saying to the Tibetans invade, it's very, they have their invasion routes charted very easily. And at most there's two armies coming through two mountain passes and attacking one or two castles that the majority of people in this area don't notice, don't care. And it's very, it's very sort of out of sight, out of mind for them. Yeah. And, and it seems like the, the Zabdrung kind of coming up and setting this kind of more centralized bureaucracy, I guess you could say, with these temporal and and spiritual arms is kind of like saying, look, okay, let's just get everyone here and let's just all agree on kind of, you know, one thing and we'll and you will build some songs on the on the borders and then we can kind of focus more on on everything on the interior um, under kind of one rule of law, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's, it's a lot to gain and not a lot to lose. Yeah. But I mean, at the top of this, this dual system, you know, you have the Zabdrung. So what happens when the Zabdrung dies? Does his son inherit then? So um, the fun stuff. <laughs> um, the Zabdrung dies in about 1651. His death is kept a secret because it's believed that if it's not kept a secret, then internal enemies will attack. The external enemies that the Tibetans, and the Mongols will attack. His death is kept a secret. And it's hoped that his son will inherit and take over. I can't remember the exact date, and the book's a little bit thick right now. But his son, around this time, I believe shortly after uh, his father dies, it seems like he has a stroke. 
of course, since they don't have modern medicine, they're using context clues based on the text. But it seems like his son, John Paul Dorji, has a stroke and is kind of incapacitated. Regardless, whatever happens to him, he doesn't speak for the rest of his life. And he did have a daughter, but that daughter died uh, a year before the Javdrung's death. And I think that actually his daughter, his, his granddaughter's death was what hastened his, his, dec- his um, decline of health. That he was, he was quite depressed for a very long time. And when he finally did enter spiritual retreat, which he then died in, um, they think that that had a lot to do with it, that his only granddaughter had died and then his son soon enough had a stroke. And now the the succession is very much in question. Yeah. So do, do they pick somebody out of these dual roles to, to fill in as the new Zabdrung or do we have a reincarnated Zabdrung who, who I guess might also come from these one of you know the higher ranks of these two orders? So to, to simplify things very, very much, the Zabdrung's death is hidden. And that kind of keeps the peace for a while to need to look for someone to fill this position, especially not, you know, the, the stroke victim, John, poor John Paul Dorji. So the Jay Kenpo and the Desi just kind of go about their business doing what they have to do. And when it comes to the Jabdrung, they just, well, he's in spiritual retreat. You don't bother someone in spiritual retreat. That's basically how even when the Tibetans are invading, you don't bother someone in spiritual retreat. There are a few instances where the Jabdrung has to be there. Like he has to come out of spiritual retreat to say tonsure new uh, monastic initiates, which is when they they pull out a few of their hairs and then they go off and shave the whole thing. And in that case, they just get someone who sort of looks like him to appear and just sort of pretend to be him for a while because all he's got to do is pull out hairs and he's sort of in a darkened space anyways. So, but how how long can this go on? It goes on until about seventeen twelve. <laughs> so he's. It becomes literally an open secret that in one of these invasions, the Tibetans go, the, one of the Tibetan generals basically says, I refuse to believe that the ruler of Bhutan is a 110 year old renunciate who eats nothing but milk and bananas. <laughs> and, and this is true. At the, at, at the end of his life, he, he was a vegetarian who only ate milk and bananas when he, he meets uh, the first Westerners in Bhutan are Portuguese. And the two Portuguese milk and bananas with him. And uh, he's just, not, yeah. So by the time this Tibetan invasion takes place, he's 110 years old. They're like, no, we, we'd refuse to believe that. He, this can't be real. And what ends up happening is that the Javdrung dies and they declare him, they, they, they refuse to let this secret out because they're afraid of uh, the Mongols and the Fifth Dalai Lama. When the Fifth Dalai Lama dies in 1682, they keep that a secret. So for a roughly 30 year period, <laughs> the two highest kingdoms in the world were were uh, necrocracies, you know, <laughs> that they were ruled by two dead people um, who were officially in spiritual retreat for fear that the other one who they didn't know if they were alive was going to invade. So how do they how do they end up resolving this? And I mean, presumably they had a nice conversation over milk and bananas. But I mean, what is the end result of that? In, in the south, in Bhutan, uh, the, there is a brief period where they try and look for a reincarnation of the Jabdrung, and they, they give up on that search. What ends up happening is that the Desis sort of take over and run things because, um, and this is, in Bhutan today, the expression they like to use is religion is above politics. And in Bhutan today, if you are registered as a religious official, so if you're part of that side of the dual government... So if you are a monk, if you are a lama, if you are a gelong, which is a lay priest, so you haven't taken your monk vows, but you, you teach and you, you, you do everything. It's, an, it's a Nyingma tradition. So if you teach and if you, you do these initiations and all these rituals, if you are uh, a gomchen is what I meant, a gomchen. If you are a shaman, so if you, if you have the religious tradition that predates Buddhism, if you're any of these things, and I'm sure the list probably continues to the things that I'm only vaguely aware of, you cannot vote or hold public office. So the J. Kenpos rule the religious half as they've always been doing. The Desis are busy doing a little more stuff that we'd be familiar with in traditional historical terms. They're, they expand Bhutan's border eastward to basically where it is today. One of them has plans to go westward all the way up to Ladakh, which again is in Jammu and Kashmir. So he wants to take Sikkim, all of Nepal, all of Mustang, all of Ladakh. Uh, it doesn't quite work out like that. But they had plans to to really expand Bhutan all over the place to build up sort of this Drukpa Kedju shield against the Galukpas and the Mongols. What happens is, and there's an interesting history in and of itself, but again, beyond the scope of the podcast, 
the Jabdrung's nephew, Tenzin Rabge, who it's rumored that he's actually his bastard son, but Tenzin Rabge ends up being the man to take over. And he becomes, he and he is officially the fourth Desi, but he definitely seems like he has a position a bit above the Desi and almost seems like, seems like he has taken on a Jabdrung position himself because he's there ordering around J. Kenpo's. He um, expands the monastic population by, I think, a third or, or by, uh, by three. So um, he goes around, he does a whole tour of the country, basically taking every third son as part of a monk tax um, and increases the size of the, the Zongs. He builds some of Bhutan's most famous sites. So most people, if they type in Bhutan, they'll immediately see Taktsang and Tenzin Rabge built that. Uh, he built all these songs. He did this. He did that. So he does. He does a lot of the work that the Jabdrung kind of laid out, and he's doing a lot of this cultural solidification. He's doing a lot of the political solidification. Tenzin Rabge, like the Jabdrung, like John Paul Dorji, took these lesser vows so that he could hopefully produce an heir. And to read the histories, it sounds like people are just shipping him women. One of one of the vows of a monk is you cannot be a matchmaker, but they seem to have have very very completely ignored this rule for the sake of for the sake of political continuation that they're they're trying to match up Tenzin Rabge with a woman who can somehow give him a son and Tenzin Rabge ends up with one daughter or two or uh, one or two daughters both of which uh were interesting women in their own right and the one who they hoped would succeed um they got all excited that oh he's his wife is finally pregnant she's going to have a son that they, they make all these masculine gifts to give the child when it's born. And, of course, it comes out a girl. To try and meet, uh, mitigate that, they give her a boy's name. But then she dies of plague in, I believe, 1705. And it's, is, at this time, are, you know, can we call this area Bhutan at this time? Uh, nope, it's still Loman at the time. It's probably, it, I believe it, it's starting to become more uh, popular to call it Drukul, which means Dragonland. Um, after, after the Drukpas. After the Drukpas. Um, it's still called Loman, which is Southern... Mun is, it has a bit of a mysterious origin, but Southern darkness, Southern southern mis- mystery land um, was its more common title in the Job Drunk's time. Uh, I want to say about now it's starting to become called Drukul. Bhutan is actually an English term that a Scotsman came up with in the 1770s. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I, I guess Bhutan is not called Bhutan right now, I guess we could say. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but for the sake of this episode, we're going to keep course. calling it Bhutan. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, when do we see, I mean, because it sounds like we have the Zabdrung who comes in, sets a lot of the, the groundwork for unifying this new country. Uh, and then his nephew goes out and kind of really unifies it. But it sounds like his nephew kind of has the same problem that the Sabdrang originally had where in the fact that there's no clear line of succession. Right. When Tenzin Rabge dies in the 1690s, you have a new Desi who takes charge named Kunga, Kunga Gyaltsen. And Kunga Gyaltsen, it's a bit, it's, it's, it's not a bit, it is quite unclear exactly why he does this. But Kunga Gyaltsen, um, who's the Desi who is performing the ritual, which still exists today. If you go to Punaka every day, the monks lay out food for him and, and bless it and, and then slide it under the door where his body is, was, would have been meditating, but he's doing all these rituals. But one day Kung Gyaltsen basically opens the doors and lifts the covers and reveals that the Jabdrung has died. So even though it's an open secret, even though everyone knows, okay, there's not a 110 year old dead man meditating, drinking milk and bananas. It's an open secret, but now the secret is out, you know, so and Kunga Gyaltsen has very purposefully, for whatever reason, done this. And uh, Karma Funso, the, the, the scholar who's writing a lot of the, who's, who's assembled most of this in English, is um, positing that Kunga Gyaltsen believed he was the reincarnation of the Jabdrung, or at least was was promoting that image, that he was the Jabdrung reincarnate, because it's it's abundantly clear at this time that the Gya family there's certainly no direct line. And if there are cousins and people interested in ruling, we haven't heard from them yet. So the, the Gya family is clearly not the future of Bhutan. So they're promoting this reincarnated lineage that the Dalai Lamas have seized with both fists. And um, what happens after that is, and this is an apocryphal tale, but 
but one that illustrates what happened very, very nicely that Kungu Gyaltsen is, is praying, meditating by the Jabdrung's corpse and three beams of light shoot out from the Jabdrung's body. One to Dagana, which is in Bhutan, one to Sikkim uh, today in India, and then one all the way to Tibet. And what happens is after this, perhaps as punishment for the Jabdrung's own earlier conflict, three incarnations called the mind, speech, and body incarnations are found both claiming to be the Jabdrung. And again, in Buddhist, uh, certainly Tibetan Buddhist theology, there that's not that's not impossible, you know, that there is no real self. Um, in, in Hindu theology, the self reincarnates, that there's just one soul that goes into another body. In Buddhist theology, that what makes up you is different components. So that these different components might be reincarnating is certainly plausible. And in the future, what we see happen is that people go, well, the speech and mind incarnates are all great, but really it's the body incarnate. <laughs> that's the one we want because that's the body and the blood and the bone, right? So, um, so these are spiritual teachers who then, because there's already a tradition of inheriting your previous reincarnates possessions and monasteries and temples, becomes a problem. So, I mean, do we have a new Zabdrung at that point then? Yes, although very few Zabdrungs, not, not, not zero, but very few Zabdrungs uh, hold a lot of power after this. Yeah, so because it sounds it, it sounds like under um, his his nephew uh, uh, Tenzin uh, that uh, really that the the Desis had kind of I guess you could say that the the Desis who had been the political side of this double of this dual system had really kind of taken prominence. Yeah, so the Desis, a few J Kenpo slip in there, um, and there are a couple of Jabdrungs who take control and resume control, but mostly mostly it's the Desis, and there's you know. There's some Game of Thrones stuff going on in there, fighting over control until basically 1888. Um, there's on and off stuff happening. So what what happens in 1888 then? So in 1888, um, well, you can back up a little bit to the 1860s. Um, you have a man named Jigme Namgyal. And Jigme Namgyal um, was the Penlop, the governor of Chongsa, which is in um, about smack dab in the middle of Bhutan today. And um, he was controlling the trade from east to west and made himself very rich. He was the governor of the area. He had a, a fantastic lineage extending back to even before the Jabdrung. And he was kind of the right man to become Desi. He had a little black, black crown. When the British came to Bhutan trying to make it part of uh, British India, he played his cards right and managed to uh, expel the British and force a treaty on them that made Bhutan sort of an advisor to the British Raj and also gained monetary support for Bhutan as in a sort of tribute payment, promising that none of his men would raid into India. He gave up a little bit of land to India, but basically he has this reputation as a man who gets things done, certainly. So Jigme Namgyal became a regent. He served for three non-consecutive terms, but he was really the man running the show after that. In 1888, his son, Ugyen Wangchuk, defeats all of his rivals in Timpu at the Battle of Changanka, and that was the last real battle of Bhutanese unification, that there were men who didn't want him to be the sole ruler, and he just defeats them in Timpu, and that's that's it. In 1907, uh, he was elected, I don't know if it was unanimous, but he was at least elected uh, king by the other nobles in Bhutan, and 1907 is the beginning of the Bhutanese monarchy. Okay, so it, it seems like a, you know after all this kind of tangling between Zabdrungs and the dual system between Desis and uh, Jay Campos that they just finally say, all right, let's just have, let's have a king. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> vastly uh, I, oversimplifying, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can say that. It's, it's a vast oversimplification, but um, it, it works, I would say. The, the problem being that constitutionally, um, and of course, constitutionally in the loose sense, this was never really written down anywhere, but constitutionally, the, the kings were just kind of supposed to be a replacement Desi and you can imagine that the the King Ugyen Wangchuk had still ruffled quite a few feathers of people who weren't too keen on him being there. And there were still some of these Jabdrung reincarnates floating around, mostly as religious teachers. But what happens after Ugyen Wangchuk dies in uh, 1926, in 1928, you have two new players, his son Jigme Wangchuk and Yeshi no Duk, who is the fifth speech incarnation of the Jabdrung. And they're both about 20 years old. And we can go back to the Jabdrung and see what kind of a person he was like when he was 20 years old. 
So That's he's, the, he's inherited a bit of that, a bit of that uh, hot-headed flashiness. Yeah, they wanna, they wanna, they wanna prove their worth. So Yoshinobu, this fifth speech incarnation, he lives in uh, Tawang District, which was then in Tibet, today in Arunachal Pradesh, India, and and the the fifth king is over in in Timpu. <laughs> of course, they're both claiming that Bhutan is is theirs. You know, the king by his his royal right, the Jabdrung by dual system, and what's a real it's it's a really simple conflict that then it gets blown out of proportion the Jabdrun grants grazing rights in Bhutan to some of his followers for for their yak herds and um that's a real it's a little bizarre because even today that border is really fluid and herders cross over that all the time without it's like they don't they don't care where the grass is our yaks need to eat um, and even back then it's it's impossible to really underestimate how how very small this conflict was by comparison but of course, the king is saying, this is, you have no right to give away my kingdom. So he gets very, uh, very frustrated. And then he issues a reverse edict, issuing some of the Jabdrung's land over in Tibet to, to some of his people. And now you can see how this really escalates until 1931. Uh, so for about three years, this thing was boiling over. In 1931, three armies of, uh, from the king surround the the monastery where the ja, the fifth speech incarnation of the Jabdrung is and are basically trying to capture him to bring him into Bhutanese territory because of course at this time the Jabdrung is still in Tibet and there's a bit of a jurisdiction issue over whether the Jabdrung is a Tibetan citizen or a Bhutanese citizen and as far as the king is concerned he doesn't seem to care which citizen he was he just wants the problem solved and later that year in 1931, around November 12th, they find the Jabdrung's body with a silk scarf stuffed down his throat. But purely and by coincidence, I'm sure. Purely by coincidence. Um, there, is, there was a brief period between those two events to, for the, the monk body, the Dratsung, to intervene. And they seemed almost not to care about this issue. They seemed like, well, he's over in Tibet anyways. What are we going to do about it? And then... And then everybody wakes up and it's, it's said that even the monks next to him couldn't, couldn't wake up while he was dying, that they seemed not to, this seems like such a minor issue at the time. Again, probably because he was the speech incarnation, probably because the Jabdrungs hadn't been in control of Bhutan in such a long time. And probably because they weren't really sure, they, they probably weren't keen on a lot of this trouble coming to their, their temple. Yeah, but I mean, when we think of Bhutan today, we probably, I mean, because this is a, a country that, you know, coined the term, you know, gross national happiness. So, and we don't think of it as being this kind of war torn, civil war kind of um, country, you know, do we? So, I mean, is there is there a point when, you know, one of these two power structures, the Zabjong or the king, kind of reaches dominance after this, you know, period? Yeah, there is, there's a very significant uh, peace development. I think. One thing that strikes me about Bhutan is this law of karma that they're they're very they're pretty aware of every action has an equal and opposite reaction, which is our scientific way of describing karma. Really, the the king who ordered not one but two Jabdrung reincarnates killed, or allegedly, he was then racked with uh, nightmares and mental formations at the end of his life that the ghost of the Jabdrung was coming for him. One of his most prominent visions was one of his attendants who was invading his dreams, drawing his gun to kill him. And, um, you know, he, he did this did not sit well with him. And this is especially uh, prominent in a lot of popular Bhutanese tales, even today of, of um, people who kill do not do not sit well with that. You know, the, the, that killing is not something that you can deal with. So I think this notion of karma is what later influenced gross national happiness that that king had. A son who was Jigni Dorji Wanchuk, I can't remember, but all the kings were Jigni something until, uh, except the first king. So the third king of Bhutan existed. He had his own drama regarding modernization and the conflict between traditional development and modernization. When he died, the fourth king comes to power, and in 1979, he makes a trip to India, and the Indians who are, are are very close with Bhutan, they have what's called the road to friendship, um, is everything, everything regarding Indian Bhutan is the road to friendship, the road to friendship. These reporters are following him in India, and they say, you're one of our closest neighbors, one of our closest allies, but we don't know much about you. For example, what's your gross national product? And the fourth king of Bhutan replies, 
gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Um, this is somewhat of an apocryphal tale, but the, the, the sentiment rings true. And soon afterward, Bhutan began focusing on these alternative modes of development. Um, so that was in 1979. And probably one of the reasons it's apocryphal is that TV only came to Bhutan in the 1990s. Um, <laughs> Uh, the newspapers in Bhutan, um, the most common newspaper is the Kunsul, which is allegedly independent and free, but they probably wouldn't survive without money that they get from the, the monarchy. So they're funded by the monarchy who, who, who is, is advocating free speech, is advocating democracy. But again, you can see how those sorts of conflicts of interest take place, but it is still a case of, of this is a, a very, a very old culture, a very traditional culture, a very hierarchical culture that even when the fourth king basically proclaimed democracy against everyone's wishes, people were trying to dissuade him from it. And there's a common sentiment in Bhutan today that if the king basically said, we're going to do away with democracy, um, the people would just be all for it and they would probably vote it, vote for it in the next parliament. I think we're kind of I think we're kind of already moving into our epilogue where I wanted to kind of ask you, you know, what is what is the state of the state of Bhutan today? So the state of Bhutan today is um, very much this, you know, to conclude our, our saga of how Bhutan was founded between the Jabdrungs and conflict with the king is very much a state of union of those two areas. The current J. J. Kempo Tulku Jigme Choda um, actually proclaimed that the fourth king was an incarnation of the Jabdrung. One of the one of the edicts that the Jabdrung promoted um, and put out into Bhutan was that the purpose of a ruler is to increase the people's happiness and that he is there to promote the people's happiness and make benefit for that. So you can see how how just that even that notion is I mean, you can you can sort of echo that uh, the Declaration of Independence and the, the pursuit of happiness but you can sort of see how that is a, a direct trans, a direct ancestor to gross national happiness, which is, I don't want to say a scientific attempt, but it's a more systematic attempt to try and increase the people's happiness. Um, gross national happiness, it focuses a lot on development and how to develop the country. One of its pillars is, for example, uh, preservation of the environment. And Bhutan, constitutionally, the new constitution was drawn up in 2008, constitutionally has to protect two-thirds of its country as as protected forest and today they have gone beyond that and almost uh three quarters of the country is protected forest the benefit to that is that bhutan today is the world's first carbon sink country and that's kind of a nice a nice thought even when you read all these headlines about the great barrier reef collapsing and all these things um there's a little bit of hope there that hey if we can all kind of band together about this sort of environmental preservation maybe we too can be carbon sinks one of the one of the downsides to that, just to give sort of a counter example, is that people in these national park protected zones um, who've been living there for, for generations are encountering problems when, say, wild boars are tearing up their crops and that they can't do much about that, that they can't, say, take out their old musket from the back and, and kill that boar because these are protected lands, protected forests. But then it becomes a little bit of a conflict. What about the people in those zones? Bhutan is... One is a haven, for example, for uh, Bengal tigers, because while India is getting rid of its tigers through various means, Bhutan has all this <laughs> protected forest that the tigers are finding refuge in. So you can see how how then it becomes a question. And when I was in Bhutan, this was a lot of what we were looking at was was how do you make people happy and that these are good pillars. And that's kind of what they are is they're pillars of and a framework. But the details of happiness and how happiness works are much are much harder to, to work out and um and i and i think that's probably a good example for where bhutan is today that they have this framework they have these pillars they have these institutions of the jabdrung and the monarchy that are now united under under one lineage and they're trying to work out these details but one step at a time each um with each new parliament bhutan gets a little more democratic a little more free uh, in politically we'd say but the point is that they want to take it one step at a time they don't want just here's all the freedoms here's all the powers here's all the development all the technology all of the progress all the westernization they're taking it one step at a time and i don't i don't think that's a bad way to go certainly with its contentious history um i think 
the important thing to consider is that these were people who were living people's lives. And it's important for us not to place our own assumptions that this was a happy Buddhist kingdom all the time, that no, it, there were real people living there who had real people problems. And today they still have real people problems and that um, there may be worth giving an extra ear to. Ear to. Well, I, I want to thank you for talking to us about this fascinating subject and kind of making it, you know, bring it down to the fact that these are real people. Uh, thanks. It's it's something I'm afraid a lot of people do forget, especially when they hear about some something like gross national happiness. Um, there was still a lot that we definitely didn't get to cover, but it was uh, that's certainly, I think, one of the more interesting stories. And I would love to talk more. And if anybody has a question, please hit me up on our Ask Historians. Thank you again. Thank you. And as always, thank you all for listening. And thanks, big thanks to our Patreon subscribers uh, and to the Ask Historians panel uh, for their wonderful uh, book suggestions that we've been uh, supplying to our uh, our Ask uh, our Ask Historians Patreon uh, supporters. So I, I hope this episode shown a, a light on a place in the country and in history that I'm pretty sure is relatively obscure for most people. So I hope. If you didn't know where Bhutan was before, you know where Bhutan is now, and you know a whole lot more about it. And though most people probably do know where Tibet is, you probably got a, a better peek into kind of the politics and society of that nation. So, it, it, yeah, Tibet's one of these really fascinating countries that unfortunately doesn't get talked a lot about that has its own very unique history. You know, we, most people don't talk about the Tibetan Empire, but hey, I mean, it was kind of there. So um, hopefully we can um, have Jimmy Dorje back to you know talk a little bit more about these subjects as well. Uh, I, I hope you managed to keep some of the names uh clear here they, they do kind of come hot and heavy uh particularly if you don't have a background in this you know trying to keep your your zabjongs separate from your songpa emperors is, is it can be a little bit difficult but I, I tried to kind of you know go back and recap as we were going along and make everything clear so if you have any questions please feel free to go to the discussion post we put them up on the ask a store and subreddit uh, for every one of these episodes so and if you, it's a few days later don't worry come by and ask questions you know these things don't shut down for six months uh, and if you're if you're if you're a latecomer, then feel free to post a question. I'll make sure it gets to our, our guest. Um, we have had a, a, a kind of a, we've had we've had a significant increase in, in listeners over the past few months. So I just want to say uh, hello. And hope you're enjoying the podcast. Uh, if you are a new listener, I usually suggest that, well, I, I acknowledge the fact that the earlier episodes can be uh, kind of rough in production qualities, although the information is still usually top-notch and solid. Uh, so I usually suggest that even as you're skipping around, you kind of start with the earlier episodes and you kind of work your way back through the catalog. Um, at, at some point, I will, when I have much more free time on my hands, I, I do plan on going back and because I, I still have uh, all the raw uh audio files from at least the ones that that i did starting from about episode 13 on uh to kind of go back and and re-attack those with the, the lessons i've learned from audio production now although we do record on both sides now of of uh you know the guest records and i record so that helps with the audio quality a whole lot uh, and that's some of you made some of those suggestions you know previously in the past we've been doing that for about the past half half dozen episodes so thank you for your, all your suggestions there um also in the ask historians uh census we asked you about the podcast and that was actually one of the suggestions that people made so that's why i'm kind of giving the, the caveat that we're doing it thanks um but some of you also asked for uh, more kind of, I guess, panel discussions, uh, you know, having two or more guests on the show. Uh, we've done a couple episodes in the past. Uh, our episode, I think, 11, 12, I should know this, um, about the golden age of piracy uh, with yeah, Eternal Carry and uh, David AOP. Uh, yeah, we did that. Uh, we also had the Spanish Civil War. Uh, that was also back in the earlier time. And I did the episode on uh, early modern medicine and uh, women's health. Uh, and that was pretty good. Uh, the problem is, is that an internet chat format is is unfortunately not the best, and you tend to get people, unless you know the the two academics that I interviewed for the women's health episode was, uh, you know, they <laughs> their colleagues who worked together, so they were a great pair who worked really well together. Um, but particularly when, uh, you know, even if you're, it, uh, unfortunately, the way that internet you know, chats can kind of go is that when you're trying to get people in a, a, a nice conversation going, it can sometimes lead to a lot of stumbling and, and people cutting each other off. And it, it, what I'm saying is it takes work, but since you guys have, have 
and so that's kind of why I kind of abandoned it. But since you guys are asking for it, I will look into uh, you know getting something together on one of our future episodes, trying to get you know a few people on, you know, maybe two or three guests to kind of discuss a topic in in a, in a roundtable fashion. So uh, look forward to that. Um, I, I do still have plans to go back and not leave you poor poor YouTube users hanging. I've gotten some um, some of the background files that we've been doing about getting time codes and things like that. So I have that all all prepped and ready to go as soon as I find a little free time. Um, this is probably enough rambling for me, so I'm, I'm just going to say uh, thank you all again for listening. Uh, thank you for supporting us on the Patreon, which is, of course, patreon.com forward slash askhistorians. Please come by and ask uh, some questions at the discussion post. We love them, and we can get some great conversation going afterwards. It's like a little me, ask me anything. Uh, that's at reddit.com forward slash r forward slash askhistorians. We sticky uh, the discussion post, so it should be right at the top of the, the, the queue there. Uh, next episode in two weeks, we will be talking uh, about the Communist Party and Black radicalism in the Great Migration, specifically, specifically in the Midwest. So, hope to see you then. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you wanted to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians Podcast. Podcast.